Hey guys, and welcome to the new episode of Full Final Live. Today, as promised, we are going to chat about all things related to developing a B2B demand generation function from scratch. And I probably have the best possible guest to co host this episode with me, Sam Kinley, uh, who now leads uh, marketing at a company called Loxa. Sam, thanks a lot for joining me today. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I keep coming across you on LinkedIn. I, I love your stuff because you also like to hand draw and write out images to, to convey your thoughts. So it's only it's only been a matter of time until we made this happen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's a pity for you guys. It's a pity um, that Sam can join our full final summit. We had back and forth conversation. I wanted him to join our lineup this year but anyhow i'm super excited to chat uh, uh to chat about bit bit demand jam today so there would be a couple of points we want to share with you guys uh the framework of uh, developing bit bit demand gen program from scratch uh questions about budgeting planning the resources channel prioritization experimentation and key metrics and report that you can uh leverage as well uh, as as always guys you are very welcome to join the conversation live or feel free to ask your questions in a zoom chat uh so we'll cover everything that you'll ask us and first of all a quick question to you guys where are you all uh joining us from i'm colin from finally warm split croatia sam where are you from i'm in florida i'm in florida so i'm looking out the window and it's 80 degrees and sunny and I'm not mad about it. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are not that uh, we are not yet there, but I believe in a few weeks and split will also enjoy 20 degrees. Yeah, Kate from Indianapolis. Uh who else? Do we have somebody from Europe? Let us know in the comments where you guys are all from. Pittsburgh. Kayla, yeah, and by the way, Kayla, thanks a lot for sharing this event everywhere. <laughs> Much appreciated. Costa Rica, Berlin, Germany, Denmark, St. Louis, Scotland, Sanya from Croatia, Pozdrav, Sanya, London, uh, Yos from Netherlands, Bangalore, India, UK, Nashville, Belgium. Cool. So again, we have a diversified uh, global audience. Yeah. So let's cover all questions related to B2B dimension. And uh, probably you guys uh, might have seen this post uh, when I was promoting this uh, live episode. I published uh, this infographic, the way how we look at um, developing B2B demand generation program from scratch uh, at fullfunnel.io. Here are 10 steps. So we'll use this framework and uh, we'll be chatting back and forth with Sam about uh, different steps. And obviously the first step is uh, developing your strategy, right? Uh, quite often I see, a, let's say misunderstanding in a B2B marketing space and our B2B marketing community uh, lots of marketers still assume that uh, demand gen is just a bunch of uh, organic content and paid media tactics, right? Where all you need to do is just publish ungated content and boost it to, to your ICP, right? Uh, but obviously, before you launch any program, any campaign, you need to have a clear strategy, and this strategy should include uh, clear ICP, right? Uh, in uh, in terms of ICP, you need to nail down five uh, pillars like thermographics, uh, buying committee structure, because you sell to multiple people, right? And you need to create awareness inside your target accounts. Next, you need to understand that different, not all companies were created equal, right? So you have different tiers inside. You need to have clear account qualification and disqualification criteria. And finally, you need to understand how your customers are buying, which we call account enrichment, right? What channels do they use? What questions they are genuinely interested in? Uh, what questions they have across their buying journey? What are the demand triggers? Basically, what can attract their attention, right? So all of these things. And obviously, you need to have clear goals. 
You can't just come and say, hey, so I want to generate a bunch of leads from my dimension program, right? And uh, also you can't expect immediate impact on your pipeline, especially if your sales cycle long, right? If you have never done it, I mean, it's not like a silver bullet that will magically uh, fill in your pipeline with uh, inbound opportunities. And of course you need uh, to plan the resources. Um, you can do it with a small team and I highly recommend to start with a small team. That's part of our approach. Uh, but there is one more thing, right? You need to get buy-in and support from your executives. And that's probably one of the most difficult tasks for B2B marketers, especially if they work for companies where marketing doesn't have a leading role, right? Maybe companies uh, these companies were led by CROs or by sales, right? There is a sales-led motion, maybe a legion motion. And then it would be extremely hard to do it. So I would love to also uh, involve you, Sam, and share your thoughts. I know you have a lot of experience here. So let's start with the first thing, how to get buy-in from key stakeholders. A lot easier said than done. I wish that, you know, what, what you just said in one sentence could be done in, in one sentence, but um, it's definitely something that needs to be worked on, continuously worked on. And, and a lot of it comes from trust and experience and having frameworks to, to guide yourself on. So when I look at getting executive buy-in to run a strategy like this, there's a couple of assumptions for this conversation that I'm going to operate under. One is that you have product market fit and you're simply at a point of like, we're adding demand gen because we want to scale. We know people like our product service. We have the ability to grow it. Now it's just how do we get it in front of more people or anything else like that? So to your, your third bullet here, the first thing I'm asking is what are our goals for this year? What's our pipeline target or revenue target? And that's what I want to orient the conversation around, because before they start to rabbit hole and think, how many leads do we need to get? I say, don't worry about the number of leads right now. We need to worry about the revenue and the pipeline, because you can, we've seen some organizations take a million leads to get to that revenue number. And I've seen some organizations take a hundred leads to get to that revenue. It all comes down to the definition of like, how do we want to attract people? But like to start at that level, the North Star is revenue, is pipeline. Once you have that, I like to look at current state. So, okay, we want to get to 10 million. Right now we're at 5 million in revenue. So how are we going to do that over the course of the year? And when we get into that, what I like to look at is just like, what's our current resourcing look like? So whether that's people, whether that's infrastructure, whether that's budget that we have to run. And then let's just get into some basic projections. So if we were to run at the same status quo of last year, there might be some efficiencies we'll find, but if we want to, if we generated 5 million in revenue last year, we want to generate 10 this year, we might find, hey, we're on pace if we don't change anything at all to generate 6 million in revenue this year. Cool. Okay. So that's kind of our baseline. Now, how do we come up with that, that 4 million difference? And that's where you want to start digging into the data. Um, you have this later on in the chart, and it's one of the things that I that I like to look at is like the reporting, the analysis, because that's going to inform a lot of the like the resources to run the program, how we're going to get there. So now that we know, you know, we're we're four million off of the goal that we want to get to, how can we get there? And that's when we start thinking about the different levers that we have to pull. So that's is it more spend? Is it more leads at the top? Is it more BDRs? Is it efficiencies through the funnel? What are the different things that we can pull in order to make that happen? Insert the fun part of the conversation that is the blended funnel. A lot of execs look at this and they just say, you know, all of our leads convert at this rate, but you and I both know, and a lot of the people on this call know, not all leads are created equal. I know Chris coined that term a while ago, but it's spot on. Because it really is, if you have people coming to a webinar, you have people downloading an ebook, you have people coming straight to your website and saying, like, I want to talk to sales, those convert at wildly different rates. And what we want to orient our marketing around is where will we get the best output and return? Because each of those are different psychological map and, and demand strategy to get them to go into those different buckets. So that's where you'll want to you'll wanna start going into that. Um, I do have a, a sheet that we can go through in a little bit that looks through all of those different levers, but at the high level, it's it's basically mapping those out and then just saying, how do we want to get to those goals? And then 
before you start pulling all those, my favorite question is I'd like to, to stop before you start going really deep on everything and pick out, you know, the CEO, the CRO, someone to get ahead of the conversation around leads and just say, let's talk about the last purchase that we made for our company. How did you go about it? You know, did you did you go and buy Marketo or HubSpot? You go and buy Zoom, something else. And what this is going to do is they're going to be able to say, you know, I talked to I talked to my buddy over at this organization who uses it. I saw the CEO post something on LinkedIn. I heard it on a podcast. I watched the video how to. I saw it in the community. And I'm just checking off those boxes. None of those are going to show up in attribution. None of those are like your, your traditional leads. When they came through, they came straight to the website, or this is something I've been doing lately. I'm just going straight to an exec or a sales rep that I trust at the organization. I'm sending them a DM. I'm sending them an email directly and saying, hey, I want to talk about buying lists. I want to skip the, like, I don't need the, the discovery with a BDR. I know what you do. I know the value you can provide. Let's just get straight into the use casing and everything else. And what that does is they see, oh yeah, okay, so it isn't those those lead funnels that get people to come in at the end of the day. Like there is some some other things that come into play that inform that decision. So that's where it helps you start out on the right foot of like, okay, I guess I get this whole demand gen strategy that you're pushing now, and it's not all just a matter of get leads, insert into a funnel, nurture drip campaign, and you're going to magically have customers. Yeah, I love that's it. I'm going to stop for a sec. Yeah, I love it. But actually, spot on with uh, analyzing the way how you purchase software, right? So just a simple question. Okay, let's look, let's uh, review our latest purchase, right? And it, obviously, we're talking about high ACV purchase where we invested a lot of money. So what did it came from? Did it come from a cold email, from an SDR, from a known vendor, let's say? You just click the display ad and you just... <laughs> Paid 50k for something, right? Without yeah, <laughs> just, right. just because just because of fantastic copy put on the landing page. So that's exactly uh, that. That's the first thing. The second one, I believe, what makes perfect sense as well uh, is having a honest conversation with sales and potentially depending on the size of your company, maybe not that much relevant to. Uh, corporates to enterprise companies, but let's say for scale ups, for startups, for small organizations, right? It makes sense also to involve key stakeholders and just uh, have a honest conversation about all the challenges sales face, right? That could be like, okay, so we're always compared to our competitors, right? We are losing on brand uh, companies, or let's say our prospects, they don't understand the value our product provides, right? they always negotiate lower price and, and challenge us to provide discounts. So lots of these things, right? You, but everybody needs to be frank and honest here, right? And everybody needs to accept these challenges. So maybe they say, okay, so nobody knows about our company. So there is a huge risk for our customers to purchase our product. Nobody wants to deal with unknown vendor, right? So lots of these things. And the next logical question would be, okay, how are we going to solve these challenges, right? And then it could be a fantastic opportunity. Okay, now it's time to talk about demand generation. And you mentioned that you have a document with several layers, right? So maybe potentially let's uh, dive into it. Yeah, happy to do that. So let me pull this up. So this is a very high level grammar, make it a little bit smaller so we can all see it here. But the way that I always like to approach it is just simplify your funnel before you get into everything being super complicated. But you'll go and baseline all of your historicals, right? So you can look at your past 12 months or something. How much are we spending? What's this generating in terms of uh, high intent hand raisers, people who explicitly want to talk to you? This is the funnel we'll be focusing on. And then there's just some calculations that come out of that. What's our conversion rates to opportunities? What's our win rate from there? What's our ACV? And what you can start to get to is you can say, okay, so every 12 months, we know that we're bringing in $30,000 per month. Well, when we start getting into goals, so say we need to come up with $100,000 per month, this is where you can start playing with different levers that I built into this template. Um, we'll share it for free. Everyone's, everyone's welcome to use it. Um, but you can look at the different levers like we spoke about. So one is, what if we only increase spend? How will we get to the $100,000? What if we get a little bit more efficient and are able to decrease our cost per demo? 
What if we increase our demo to opportunity conversion rate? What if we increase our win rate, ACV? You can see where I'm going with this. There's a number of different levers that you can pull. It's different marketing tactics, platforms, um, processes, and then even getting into sales relationship stuff and, and partnering with them. So what you'll see is these are a bunch of point solutions, but the reality of it is we need to be able to, to come up with a blended approach where it's like, okay, let's play with a little bit of all of them. What if we increase spend some? What if we get a little bit more efficient with the cost per demos? What if we increase our win rate a little bit? And so that's where you really want to be thoughtful. And, and this is what it helps come up with, because if we just said, like going back to thinking, is spend the only lever? We want to go from 30,000 to 100,000. Well, you've got a good delta, you've got $70,000 you need to make up. And this is saying, if you don't make any efficiencies better, you're actually going to be losing money. You're going to be spending $111,000 per month to generate $100,000 in revenue. Good luck selling this one to your exec team. They're not going to buy in. They're going to say demand gen doesn't work. You're going to start off on the wrong foot. And so that's where you want to play with all of these to be able to come up with you know, we could we could work it all out where it's like we only need five thousand dollars extra per month because what we're going to do is tighten up our targeting and that's going to allow us to have cost per demos that are a little bit cheaper. And because we know we're getting in front of the exact right people with good content, they're going to convert to opportunities at a higher rate. As a result of all that, sales conversations are going to go better. They're going to want to be a partner with us, buy the product. So we're going to see win rates go up. And because we don't have to pull these people who are kind of stretch fit customers they're going to get the value. So they're not going to be worried about discounts or anything else. They're going to understand the value right off the bat. So our ACV may go up. So that completely changes the conversation of give me $5,000 more. I'll work through everything else. And now we're going to go above that $100,000 target per month. And we're, we're going to be able to hit it. So this is where I say, think about all of the levers at your disposal. It's not just more media budget, more organic social posts, posts will make it work. Demand gen, you really have to go all the way through the funnel, go past the platforms and think about what is the experience of the prospect? How are you working closely with sales and customer success? And that's what's going to help you really accomplish these different goals. So again, we'll I'll, sh I'll share this model with y'all after, but this is the easiest way that I like to think of it before you completely overcomplicate it with all the different funnel stages and everything else. Yeah, I love it. Actually, the this probably one of the easiest way to persuade stakeholders because you show real numbers real data right and you can compare channels you can compare uh, you can compare motion let's say if your organization is just running paid advertisement and outbound right so you can compare all of these metrics we also love to track sales pipeline velocity uh, and add sales cycle lengths right because again uh there are could there could be some tactics if company let's say says okay so but we are generating opportunities we are called outreach right and then you can look at the sales cycle length so if these opportunities are closed let's say in 12 months in 15 months right comparing to the sales cycle lengths that might come from demand generation that's uncomparable right so you just generate revenue faster and lots of companies this by the way from my point of view one of the things lots of uh, b2b companies actually neglect to look at so they forget that uh, aside from net new revenue or opportunities on that they can increase acv or short on sales cycle and generate revenue faster hits uh, revenue targets faster right so that's that's one of the things that i believe makes perfect sense to look at um so what's coming next is uh basically let's say we got buy-in by the way guys uh let me ask you if that uh, model makes perfect sense to you if uh you believe uh if you had let's say if you had issues to get buy-in from your stakeholders you can use something like uh like this model and share data to persuade them share with us in the chat would love to hear your comments right but generally speaking let's say you nailed it down uh you got support and then you start with uh basic strategy setup icp goals marketing message and uh one of the things that you need to have as well is customer research right obviously you need to understand what channels do they use for uh education for evaluating vendors, for getting feedback or recommendations, et cetera, right? What are the questions and topics they're 
interested in. Uh, also, it's really important to understand jobs to be done, right? So what's these people are in charge of? What are their typical challenges, right? What they're dealing with? Uh, also, it's important to understand who they follow and trust, what communities and associations do they engage with because of part. We have lots of these terms coined by Chris, which we can use today, dark social and all of that stuff, but that's real, right? So lots of people use communities, etc. They believe they are peers more than just Google reviews or G2 crowd reviews, let's say. So you need to somehow establish your presence in all of these channels. You won't be able to push buyers, right? But you can establish your presence and influence the buying process. So uh, when you have done it right the next step uh basically what uh, we do we categorize all the topics i'm not saying programs right now so so far we collect all of this insights that we have collected and basically maybe if you have questions how do we collect it the number one uh way and the best way is by interviewing your customers right so it's just my go-to recommendation all the time just talk to your customers have this in-depth conversations and learn from them uh, next, obviously, you can look at uh, all digital traces they left So in your digital analytics that uh, you can get additional insights, right? They are not a substitute for customer interviews. You'll just see a part of the visible part of their journey, right? Or That's why I'm calling this digital traces. But you won't understand the buying journey and go looking at Google Analytics, let's say, right? So that could be that could accompany your, your research. And next, we put all the insights that we have collected into four buckets. The business triggers, so basically what might happen in clients' business that uh, can push them to start looking for product like yours. Next, lots of B2B companies, uh, and especially those that are selling complex products or high ACV products, they are dealing with unformed demand which means there is no demand at all. Companies are not actively buying these specific solutions or products, right? So uh, that means that you need to think about, that's why I mentioned jobs to be done, right? You need to think about what exactly can attract their attention, what they would like to learn more, what can educate them, what can help them to run their, or execute their jobs better, right? Lots of these things. And only next, when you collect all of these insights, you can start planning the programs, what exact campaigns you can do, right? In what format, et cetera. I would love to hear also your thoughts, um, Sam, and I know that you're going through that process at Loxa, so it would be cool if you share your experience as well. How do you start, right? When you, when you finally got the support from key stakeholders. Yeah, and I think that second point, is so important the demand triggers because this is a mistake that, that I've seen time and again and even something that I used to go through. Um, it's really easy to put ads in front of people, right? You can pay for that. The ad platforms will say, yes, I'll, I'll gladly take your money, but is it something worthwhile to put in front of your, your ICP? Is it something that they care about? Is it something that's going to help them? Because if it's not, you're going to pay to get a bunch of impressions, but they're going to scroll right past it. But like you said, if it's something that's, that's helpful for them or it's one of those triggers, that's what will catch their eye. That's what will build the, the affinity and trust and really help you start that process there. So just want to want to really emphasize that point and, and how critical it is there. Um, as I've been thinking about these topics, um, I've been right there with you. I've been talking to customers. I've been talking to our sales team all the time to hear the conversations. Um, really funny story. So my wife and I used to work at the same company. She was in sales. I was in marketing. She would always come to me and say, why are we running this campaign? It doesn't make sense. It's not relevant to the time of the year. It's not the type of stuff that is helpful to them because I used to just take things and we were marketers, right? We'd say, okay, let's go run this campaign. It sounds good. But she's just like, no, you have to think about where these organizations are. Are they in budget season? Are they in the off season? Anything else? So that's where having that sales relationship also is really helpful. So you can get that type of feedback for scheduling and, and they'll appreciate it as well. But getting back to the like the campaigns and the planning and everything else. So the 
the first step that I'll I'll ask and think about is there's there's two buckets that you might be coming into. Either you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of content and a, a strong library to start. You're lucky if you do, or it's a little well, I'll just call it bleak. You have to build the engine from the beginning. So say you're coming into an organization that already has a content engine. Love that. Basically, you can go in and pull insights from from what's already been out there. What's landed well organically, you can look in Google Analytics, you can talk to your customers, what's been helpful, um, see what's been referenced by sales calls that have pulled people in, and then you just create some more structure around that. So every month, based on where we know our audience spends their time, um, how many people we can target there, what the, the different costs are on the platforms, whether it's impression share, CPMs, things like that. We want to create X number of blog posts, X number of landing pages, Y number of videos, this number of customer stories. And you can start to think about it that way and get very methodical with it. Most startups don't have that luxury. And, and so that's what I'm currently going through is you have to build the content engine out. So the resourcing is, is very um, critical to get to get set up on the right foot. So I stole this framework from Chris Walker. I absolutely love it. But basically, when you do start building this content engine, you're going to want four key people. One is the subject matter expert. This is a person that understands your ICP. They help separate your brand from others because instead of saying there is a problem, they're saying there's a problem and here's how you solve it. I've done it before. I've been in your shoes. That's a critical piece to building that trust. Second part is the complete opposite of that. It's the project manager. This is the person who's able to connect the dots from content to ideation, to production, to distribution. They keep everything going internally to make sure that you're getting it out. Third person is the creative. So this is the individual who's able to take these podcasts recording and turn it into videos, micro videos, blog posts, infographics, visuals, anything else. But what's important here is and I know, Andre, you and I were talking about this a little before the call, and we'll get into it, but how you show up on each platform will mean very different things in terms of the medium and how you present the content. So this person is, needs to be very dialed into where you're starting at and how you're showing up on those platforms. The fourth person is the amplifier. So this is the person who knows how to take the content and then through targeting, through the manipulation of the ad platforms, they know how to get it in front of the right people for you. So... I would say start with those four things. And then from there, you can start to, to grow and scale. And that's where you get into like, assume you already have a content engine. Now you make it a little bit more methodical. You have your framework and you just start following it out based on the results that you're seeing. Uh, from your point of view, which of these, uh, let's say, functions can be outsourced? And uh, obviously, aside from subject matter expert, right? That should be an in-house person. It's yeah. just, you'll, you'll have a huge trouble if you don't have in-house subject matter experts but yeah. that that could be also potentially solved i will share some thoughts later yeah so i'll i'll share like where i'm currently at and everything but when i'm thinking about what do we keep in-house versus what do we outsource so the sme you definitely want someone who's either a part of your company or strongly associated with your brand if it's a customer or someone like that Project manager, um, depending on the size of your organization, you'll usually want that someone internally. So that's me right now. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely taking that on because I want to make sure that we're getting the engine built properly. Um, the creative and the amplifier. So I'm personally, I am outsourcing those in current state and end goal is to own both of those. But I know people who are phenomenal at turning one content pillar piece into something that is micro videos, it's bit, um, you know images, anything else. So I'm outsourcing that. I could do it, but it's not the best use of my time, nor are my skills. You're going to get a bunch of like stick drawings like you see me put up on LinkedIn versus the things that people actually want to see. And then the amplifier. So that's, again, where I'm leveraging um, Refine Labs is, is the agency that helps really just make sure we're getting in front of the right people. They're aligned with the philosophy that I want to run and everything else. So um, you'll want to do what's what's best for you and also what plays to your strengths and weaknesses and, and keep that in mind. But that's kind of the the rough breakout where, where I'm thinking how I want to keep that mix. Uh, do you believe you can outsource everything to demand an agency, even to, let's say, to the best one, right? A company like Refine Labs. And uh, the second question, what should be the right time when you can consider bringing an agency? The right time to bring on an agency. So this goes back to earlier, like if you have product market fit and you're really at the point where it's scale, that's why I would look at a demand gen agency because they, most agencies are, are 
that's what they specialize in is like, how do you grow sustainably if they're doing it correct? So um, over the past handful of years, when I was, when I was at Refine, I remember working with companies of all sizes. And one thing, very common trend that I saw was if you had strong product market fit, it was very easy to scale. If you didn't quite have product market fit yet, you didn't know your audience, you didn't know your message. They were coming in wanting to use social to test, but it's very expensive to test that on social. And you also have the board that's saying, we're running on social. Why isn't this working and driving the pipeline? It's like, well, we're using it to validate. We're not using it to scale. And those are two very different use cases. So that's how I would approach it. Um, my, my personal preference would be bring on an agency when you're ready to scale. If you don't have product market fit yet. So say I joined Loxo and we didn't have that. I would have told our CEO, I said, I don't want refined labs. I need a really strong product marketer to help us figure that out. And then we can bring in an agency later on once we have that figured out. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so we just nailed down the resources, right? Uh, the key functions. And uh, generally speaking, uh, by reviewing these four functions, you guys can understand what skill set do you need, right? For all these programs, obviously, it depends on what do you want to do. Do you want to run webinars, podcasts, social thought leadership? Uh, do you want to run some creative campaigns? Um, then you can decide, right, who exactly you might need. But my next question would be about budgeting. So how would you go about budgeting all of this? Hiring, right, or again, uh, building that team or planning the resources, budgeting, paid, organic, and all of these programs? What would be your mm -hmm. approach? Yeah, a handful of different thoughts that I think about with this. So the first one, this is what your board and leadership will love, is, is determine what's an appropriate CAC payback period, customer acquisition costs. What are we comfortable with that we know we can grow our company at? It's sustainable. So I built that into the sheet. We'll, I'll jump over to that in a minute. But basically, instead of just looking at variable ad spend, now it's going to account for your overhead. So the resources of employing the people, the agencies, building the content, everything else, because those are two other big buckets for budgeting demand generation is the overhead side of it, but the content itself, well, what does it cost to produce the podcast? What does it cost to write the blog post, create the videos, the other things that we want to get in front of people? And then the amplification. It's not enough to just go run ads on LinkedIn. Usually you're going to have to pay someone for it. You're going to have to pay an agency. Um, and even within that, if you go down another level, just because you're on a platform doesn't mean that it's going to work and scale the same. So my favorite analysis that I always do is a paid search analysis, where if you're in Google ads, people are always racing. How do I get the lowest cost per lead, the highest conversion rate? But what they often don't do is look at are those people that are converting, turning into leads on Google ads, turning into meaningful pipeline, turning into meaningful revenue. And that's where there, there becomes this gap because Google says, I'm doing really good. Look at how low this is, but you might be bidding on a keyword that isn't converting people. And if, if you keep putting money into that, it's going down a drain essentially. So you'll want to look at, well, what are those keywords that are, that are turning people into actual customers for us? It might not be the highest volume. It might not be the biggest budget item, but if you don't have visibility into that, you're, you're just hoping that you're picking the right keywords based on what Google is sharing. So um, jumping back into the document that I shared a little bit ago. So I have this final tab marketing plus overhead. And basically what you'll see is I just added an extra variable up top for overhead spend. And then I added in total CAC payback, which is now going to account for the overhead spend plus the variable spend. So same model as earlier, pretending that we we're going for $100,000 ARR target per month, but now we're saying we also have $75,000 per month of overhead spend. So that's our employees, that's a content engine, that's everything else that comes in with that. And these two numbers right here are most companies will look at what's an appropriate marketing spend, variable spend payback period, and then what's an appropriate total pack payback. So when I look at it from an ad spend level, where if we were just looking at the everything, I'm always saying, if I can get under a nine to 12 month payback period on just ad CAC payback, so that means I'm recouping the revenue from them before they even become a year within the contract. So if they turn after year one, I'm at least profitable. When you go up a level to the overhead, usually that, that gets drawn out a little bit. So I personally set my goal around 12 to 18 months. So that way, if you make it to two years, then you'll, you'll have it back then. But usually if you're in growth mode, this is, this is a number that you'll want to play at. But again, caveat this is with everything else in marketing. If you're in the enterprise space, long sales cycles, you know, high ACV, that number is going to change a little bit. But 
general rule of thumb for, for startups in like the mid-market space, you'll, you'll want to be aiming for something around there. So now all you do is you just plug in these numbers again and get to, okay, if we were going for that, we have $75,000 in overhead spend. I'm at a 15 month payback period, which is great. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Hopefully the board's aligned, but say, you know, you were really heavy in your organization and you were spending $150,000 in overhead. You can see now that just jumped us up to over two years in payback. So I might be looking at that item and saying, are there any redundancies? Are there people that we, that we don't need on the team? Are there agencies that we're paying and not fully capable um, utilizing? And that's where you can start to figure out like, what's the appropriate number that we should be spending for this if we want to make the number work. So that's kind of the, the first lens that I'll look at. And before I jump over to the paid search analysis, just give you a little sneak peek on that. Um, that's why I'm really looking to get the, the coordination with the execs and everyone else to say like, are we on board with this? Is this acceptable? If not, what do we need to do to make this number happen? Do we need to increase this ARR target even more? Could it be less? And, and it all comes back to that North Star metric of what's the revenue number that you want me to hit? Because I don't want to be, I don't want the team focusing on this demo request number. I want us to be focusing on this total ARR number at the end of the day to judge success. Love it. Love it. And a uh, quick question to you guys. Uh, how do you like the episode so far? Share with us your feedback in the chat. Would love to see. Would love to see your feedback. Share your favorite emoji or whatever type plus if you enjoy it. Hearts. Five if you aren't stars. liking it, just wait until I leave and then you can tell him after how you really feel about it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hard. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys, for your support. Happy to hear because we have a lot of stuff to cover. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, cool. Uh, so we have discussed the resources, the budgeting, right? Next, you um, mentioned the paid analysis. Ah, yes. uh, one thing that I would love also to yeah to to talk about is planning the uh, planning the campaigns right because paid is just one piece of the puzzle right you would be building different um you might be running different campaigns and this is one of the mistakes I believe lots of companies are making when they build uh, when they develop um, demand generation motion I would quickly share my screen, come back to that infographic, right? So one of the things that I believe makes sense, especially in the beginning, is starting small. We take this approach with account-based marketing and uh, we highly recommend to take the same approach with demand generation. Don't be obsessed with running multiple tactics and going into all possible channels and uh, running TikTok videos and all of that stuff, uh, despite you are hearing from every corner that TikTok is hot. So always do, first of all, prioritization. What Sam shared make, makes perfect sense. The next step from my point of view, would love to hear your thoughts as well, Sam. From my point of view, the next uh, the next uh, logical step is uh, making a hypothesis. So what programs can help us to achieve these targets right and uh once we have a list i would love to have a discussion with my team also involving sales potentially uh executives if you are working for a smaller organization right and <clears throat> we need to review the scope of the program right the budget for the program resources who needs to maintain right who must be involved how much time these people need to spend to uh set up maintain the program etc isness of launching right not all campaigns are created equal right generally speaking our full final summit just let's look at it uh, let's take it as an example right it takes a lot of time to prepare it to promote it to run it etc but the impact on our business is tremendous it's huge right but generally speaking if uh just because we do it, and let's say you see the success, it won't be the first program I would recommend you to launch because of, again, because of all the resources that you need to put in. So easiness of launching and potential impact, right? So what could be the impact on, on our targets? So the next point is, uh, which I recommend is always starting on a small scope. 
don't just print agency right from the bed. Don't uh, uh, don't request a big budget for it, right? And basically, don't try to involve a lot of people for something that is not validated, right? You can make if you have never done, if like if you uh, if you didn't have podcast or you didn't have educational webinars, right? You never done partnership events, etc. You just make a forecast, you make a hypothesis, and this hypothesis must be validated, right? Don't share numbers that are not proven. Even if you have industry benchmarks, right? Let's say I would share with you our stats. It doesn't mean that you will have the same results, right? Because we're at different uh, stages, serving different markets, etc. So that's one of the things. And uh, on the next, you can uh, basically start execution. Would love to hear your thoughts and we can touch also the paid part. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing on the benchmarks that you just said, I always like to say benchmarks are averages of many numbers. So always keep that in mind that it's not going to carry over every company to every company, like you said. But yeah, prioritizing uh, channels and, and what do we want to do? Uh, my recommendation every time is start focused and broaden out from there once you start to understand if you try to do too many things at once it's going to all be spread too thin and none of it's going to be impactful so when i simplify it down to creating demand and capture demand i usually start with um demand that's that's already ready and able to be captured so I'll usually start with Google ads unless I have a compelling reason to start with, with Bing, Microsoft ads, but usually I'll start with Google. And then what I'll do is assume you have two core types of campaigns. You've got your branded campaign. So that's going to be like your, your company name, um, company name, demo, product names, things like that. And then you have your non-branded keywords. So say you're like cloud CRM software, cloud CRM tools, you might be showing up for something like that. So what I'm going to do there is, is I'm going to go, if you've been running campaigns already with that, I'm going to go in and look at the total campaign spend for each of those in the past month or whatever time frame you, you decide upon. But the key filter here is say that um, you want to know like how much room is there for growth? I always hear that conversation from CEOs. How much more can we put into Google? It's converting. It's doing this. Like, well, there's only so many searches that come in for those keywords we can't just have people we can, it's not an infinite pool that you can have people searching from so what i'm going to do is go and look at the total spend and i'm going to pull in the filter criteria of search lost due to impression share from budget and so what this is telling us is it's showing you how many searches are available where if you do spend more you can get that back and show up for those impressions so say you spent $1,500 last month and you're losing 10% of impression share due to budget. That's saying, okay, 1,500 times 1 per, or 10%, you're going to have $150. You can add to that. And that's the cap. So I'm going to do that for all of my, what I call the high intent campaigns. And I've also see convert into pipeline, into revenue. And I'm going to say, these are the ones that I want to fund. So that's going to give me the total amount of demand to be captured. Um, my Rough rule of thumb is I don't like to spend more than 50, 60% max on demand capture. Want to always make sure that there's a there's a demand creation engine. And this is going, this number is going to fluctuate depending on the size of your total budget. So if you have $10,000 per month, it's really easy to spend $5,000 on Google. If you have a million dollars a month, you might only be able to spend $50,000 on Google. And that's a very small percent of that total. So again, use use some critical thinking as you're thinking about these percentages here. But after I understand the, the keywords that do convert, that's why I go into the demand creation side. And the most critical part of this is think about and talk to your customers. Where do they spend time? I've seen LinkedIn do phenomenally with sales, with like sales reps, with HR tech, with marketers. And then I've had people come in and they target software engineers and devs. And they're just like, why isn't LinkedIn working? Because they don't spend their time there. We can try it. Like the plat it's not the platform's problem. It's where your people spend their time. So what you said earlier about TikTok, it's like, have you thought about, are they actually on there? Are you doing this for a purpose that they've said they do spend their time on there? Or do we just want to try it because we're hearing larger, larger thoughts and recommendations towards it? So just do some critical thinking for a few seconds to, to understand that and then pick one, maybe two, two of those channels max based on that input. And then it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, get the content that is helpful for them, put it in the appropriate mediums, and you can do some basic, basic calculations, but um, I'll, I'll make sure I link to this post for y'all after, but 
if you're on a platform like LinkedIn, usually there is, you might have an audience of a hundred thousand people, but the reality of it is we usually say about 40% of people are going to, to be active in a month or so on there. So if you want to understand what's the threshold for how much you should budget for it, I would say take the 100,000 people, multiply that by 40%. And then if you know the CPMs for them, if it's $30, $40, $50, the cost per impressions, you can start to calculate, okay, how much budget do I need to put forward to reach that 40% of the audience? And then you can start to say, okay, multiply by X number of campaigns or other audiences, and you can work out your marketing budget from, from that standpoint. So that's a long-winded way of me getting around that. But again, really just want to, to hammer home like small budget, big budget. Don't get so caught up in the percentages that you might hamstring yourself or, or not do the appropriate things. Like do some critical thinking and, and think about what's right. Uh, but what I also believe is that you don't need 20 tactics, 50 tactics, etc. The more programs you are running, the more resources you need to maintain the campaigns to refine them to enhance these campaigns right to make them better and obviously it will be way more harder to to make sure that they are performing well and generally speaking i firmly believe that you need to excel at few channels and do a better job than your competitors so creating the best possible content in that category doesn't matter what the format would be uh, of your content right and excel at few programs i uh, probably our company might not be the best example but generally speaking i would share with you guys maybe some of you have seen this post from my co-founder and it's basically the stats we launched our companies two years ago right that was like no name uh abm consultant company nobody have heard right uh we didn't have a big audience just starting from scratch right and these were the results that we are getting by maintaining very simple uh dimension let's say strategy that uh, included daily thought leadership on linkedin so this one channel this full funnel podcast which was pre-recorded and now we are doing it live uh so to print you our community as well to have all of these quality conversations right uh we have newsletter I know lots of folks still have a biased opinion that newsletter is dead, but I would tell you the opposite so you can look at our numbers. And by the way, I, I just want to get your feedback, guys. Who is subscribed to Full Funnel Insider Newsletter? Type plus, please, in the chat. Just curious to see if you are subscribed to our newsletter. Um, and generally speaking, I would just give you one more point. Why? Because... Uh, your audience might not be hanging out on LinkedIn or Twitter or TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, but guess what do they open every single day? That would be the perfect answer, right, to your question. And uh, next, so we are hosting uh, monthly webinars and we have our annual full final summit, which uh, actually this year we, we will have the first edition and it will be in three weeks so and that's it this is basically what we are doing right and uh every year we are growing so that's 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 exactly the the point you don't need uh, sometimes less is more right just do a better job uh for your icp and you can see the the results uh let's see the Let's see your uh, replies. And yeah, quite a lot of people are subscribed to newsletter. So that's <laughs> that's another proof, right? So don't be obsessed with a lot of tactics. Just nail down what really makes sense for your ICP and excel at it. Do, do a better job than your competition. Always aim for a top-notch quality of your content. And uh, one of the things that I believe that you need to cultivate in your organization is the value of non-trackable touch points so not everything could be attributed right so not everything uh, just just to give you an idea some of you might be listening to this episode and maybe some of you are buyers potential customers of locks or maybe potential customers of full funnel io right we don't know but you might be sharing this episode with your peers, with your colleagues. These colleagues might forward this episode to their executives, right? And 
one of these companies, I mean, our or Sam's company might get an opportunity and that's that's how it works, right? But we'll never see this in attribution. That's another story that you need to cultivate in your organization. And one more thing that I believe it makes sense to discuss is um, it's, it's really good that you mentioned demand capturing. And I believe basically everybody wants to focus on it, right? But uh, what we have mentioned, if uh, you are selling high ACV product or service, right? Quite often you'll be dealing with uh, markets where there is no demand at all. So you need to create this demand. You need to create awareness first. But next, let's say you are running demand generation. To make sure that you get results, you need to refine your demand capturing and you need to remove friction points from your process. This is really ridiculous. When come, I know a couple of examples uh, don't, unfortunately don't want to name them, but generally speaking, these are well-known companies that are doing a really good job with demand generation, but then you come to their landing pages, you don't see pricing, you don't, the marketing messages work, right? You don't really understand what this product does. You don't understand the value. There is a long and clumsy, uh, let's say, book a demo call or request a demo. And then you are not redirected to SDR's calendar, right? Then you just see the pop-up. Hey, thanks a lot for your inquiry. Somebody from our team will reach you out in the next 48 hours. Lots of these things, right? So make sure that <laughs> you just fix the fundamentals first that you refine all of these processes and then you double down on demand generation. So just wanted to, to, to print it back. And uh, there was a question about prioritization from Sylvia. I think uh, Sam, what I would love to get your thoughts on is uh, how do you prioritize campaigns? Is it different from what I have shared and what are thoughts on experimentation? So what should be a, right balance between programs that actually deliver the results and uh, time and budgeting for new experiments. Yeah, yeah. So there's the, like the getting started is zero to one and then you have the, the scaling, the one to 10. So when I'm getting started, it's exactly what I said earlier. I'm starting focused two, three channels max, Google, and then a couple of social channels that, that you're finding out where people spending their time and, and doing that. So that's the, the starting point. And then when you start into getting to scale, that's where I'm going to look at, okay, based on the platform attribution, based on the self-reported attribution, where are people that are coming in also saying they heard about us, came about, might start to see more people are coming in from YouTube. They've been watching videos from, from different thought leaders making product recommendations or how-to advice. So you could say, that's interesting. Might wanna expand into there, there's something to it. So start experimenting a little bit, but again, keep your experiments tight because otherwise you're not gonna know what's making the meaningful lift when you do go and look at those hand raisers and everything since we've been talking about, it's sometimes it's hard to know, but um, we'll look at those two things. And then I'd also look at like adjacent channels. So if Google's working really well, then you can start to explore Bing, Quora, somewhere like those, or start adding budget to the high performing channel. So the biggest mistake I see people make is that they move on and start growing other channels before they're even close to the point of diminishing return on a, on a channel that already works well. So say on LinkedIn, you're only reaching 10 to 15% of your audience in a month. Fund that until you get to that 30, 40% before you go and try out Reddit or TikTok or Quora, any of those, like, you know, it's working, put the gas on that because what happens is if you go and, and spread out, you're going to see that the scaling results aren't, aren't doing well and leadership, or you might think, oh no, there's something wrong with the overarching strategy. It's not working, but those channels are diluting your total funnel if you're looking at it from that standpoint. And so the mistake is you're now going to reevaluate your LinkedIn strategy that's actually working instead of looking at it, it's like, no, I'm trying to do too much before going really deep there. So yeah, so that's the, that's the way that I've always thought about it. Um, I've tried a lot at once and I've learned the lessons the hard way and everything. So um, hopefully you can you can learn from my failures a little bit there, but that's been the general approach that I usually take. I know we have covered a lot of questions that we have collected from our community. I'm just sharing the screen for everybody. I believe we actually covered almost all of this. Uh, there is one question from Nicole, and I believe it just uh, would be a right time and to cover it. So examples of key metrics to measure success um, 
the, this question is uh, about dark social content strategy. I believe let's uh, break it down into two parts, key metrics to track uh, the efficiency of your demand generation program. And we can cover this one as well about dark social because lots of people are interested in it. Yeah, and I'll be curious to hear how you go about this as well. Um, so I'll start with like key metrics I'm looking at is marketing working, and then I'll get into some of the more like how do we know if the strategy is working while you're building it out? So key metrics, I, I like to keep it simple, kind of like that funnel earlier. So depending on if you're sales led, like, you know, uh, get a demo request, if you're product led sign up, or if you're blended funnel, I'm really looking at four core buckets. So the first is the high intent hand raisers or the expressed intent. So sales led, that's people that fill out the form to get a demo request or talk to sales product led. This is people who choose to sign up. Next step I look at is qualification. So in that sales led funnel, did they attend a call with the sales rep and did the sales rep validate that they are a fit, there's potential to purchase, all of that. If it's product led, I usually look at things like alpha activation within a product. So not everyone who signs up for the product activates it. They don't always connect it, everything else. There's gonna be some natural fallout there. So that's where I look at um, that point. Third step is, um, the Refine Labs team calls it the high intent revenue opportunities. It's typically close to like a sales qualified opportunity, but in, in the sales led side, it's where, what stage of opportunity are you winning at 25% or greater? Product led, I'm looking at the adoption or aha moment. So this is where you've identified like what are the different features or functions that when a user gets to that and uses it, they're going to keep using the platform. They're fully embedded in it. And then closed one. So contract sign becomes a customer and the sales led or product led, they upgrade to the full experience, they bring on the team, something like that. So um, I'm usually looking at the count of different items within those and then the amount. So the, the dollar figures that are attached. Um, recommend that, especially as you get later in the, in the funnel, you look at this quarter over quarter, not month over month, just because there's so many fluctuations in business processes and everything else. And that's gonna give you a much better sense of, of growth over time. But to get to your question about the dark social side, because this is the hardest part is getting that buy-in for the first two, three quarters. It's really tough. And 30 days in, everyone's excited. Then month two comes, month three comes and you start getting the anxious, like, is this working? Are we on the right path? So what I like to do is lay this out very explicitly in the beginning, but I basically say there's three phases to getting started. The first one's the foundation. This is going to last about four to six weeks. We're going to be gathering information, building everything. We are not launching or doing anything yet. Our performance and KPIs will remain constant to what we've seen historically. The next phase is the launch and validation. So this is 90 to 180, 180 days in, one to two quarters. This is when you're, you're launching your new campaigns, you're optimizing different things, you're enhancing your organic tactics, podcast, SME posts, things like that. And I usually look at indicators in two buckets here. The first 30 to 60 days of these going live, I'm looking at, are we getting more new users to our website from direct and organic? Are they remembering us? Are we getting more visits to high intent pages, pricing, demo, because this is showing like, are people actually interested in the offer? And then are we getting increased engagement from ad platforms? So click through rates, view rates, and then marry that with Google Analytics data. Are they spending more time on the site? Are there multiple pages viewed? Because you can get a bunch of clicks from anywhere if you want, but if they aren't staying on, it's, it's not the right traffic for you. So the key thing here is remember, demand strategy, the goal is not leads anymore, but for your content to be consumed and to be memorable. So if it's an in-platform message, your, your goal is ultimately reach and brand lift, which I'll talk about in a second. And then if it's like driving to a page, look at your on-page session metrics, video, look at the view rate. So this is something critical. Like people often see the click-through rates low, the cost per click super high. It's like, well, the purpose is to watch the video not to go to the landing page. So keep that in mind. And I know I'm rushing through this. Um, 90 to 180 days, brand lift. So look at people who come to your site from direct, organic, and paid searching specifically for your brand. This is telling you you've ingrained yourself in top of mind with them and your, your marketing is working, messaging is getting out. From there, that's when you'll start to see high intent hand raisers going up, qualified increase in hand raisers, and then the scale phase, two plus quarters, that's when you'll see more of the pipeline plus add your, your sales cycle length, and then revenue from there. So I know I kind of flew through that. I'll, uh, I'll share some more stuff after this, but wanted to try to quickly get that in for everyone before they have to hop. Yeah, I love it. 
this this really really solid advice i uh just want to drop five cents i know it's just uh, really important to realize that not all tactics will produce immediate results like you mentioned and uh one of the things that i would love also to emphasize on always track your sales cycle lengths and i believe there one of the core mistakes b2b companies make they track sales cycle lengths only let's say from request for proposal to actual payment right but the truth is we look at sales cycle lengths as the buyer journey lengths right so that you need to realize that from the day when you were able to create awareness or attract attention of target account to actual date of payment this is your real sales cycle lengths right you can call it blended marketing and sales cycle lengths buyer journey lengths doesn't really matter but that's the key point uh where i'm going with this so if you want to let's say influence dark social you know there are communities and uh if you have attended any of the past episodes we always say that aside aside from communities because by communities we marketers tend to think that these are all slack communities discord and uh maybe facebook groups etc but aside of this there are if you are in if you are selling to a con conservative market right like manufacturers healthcare etc there are lots of associations and these are communities as well they are not communities where people hang out on slack right but they have their members uh let's say doctors if you are selling to doctors or engineers etc right and they do events for them they have a corporate newsletter magazine whatever right and you need to uh basically we had experience with uh several cast not several but just with the majority of our customers who are not selling to hr tech health tech you know marketers etc their audience is not hanging out on linkedin at all not on not on on social at all right and the only way to connect with these people the leverage and partnership network and these associations so always keep in mind this right but then the next thing that you need to explain to your team is let's say you're going to partner with association and community don't expect a flow of opportunities coming immediately right your company might not be known to that community right so just establish and first touch and to make realistic this or let's say to make data driven decisions if it's worth to continue uh, collaboration with specific community association you need to allocate the same or the equal amount of time as your real sales cycle length right so if it's 12 months that would be the at least the volume of time i would allocate to test specific channel to make a real decision if it's worth or not worth to proceed for some uh, companies they might say yeah but uh, yeah it's too much but generally speaking guys uh, the next question uh, or how i would retort that question for how long are you going to stay in business so if it's if it it will take you one year to validate a channel that can generate millions of revenue for you in the next five ten years right is it worth it or no obviously maybe it's not a good way for let's say early stage startups like Sam mentioned obviously you need to get the product market fit first and you won't be able to do all of that stuff but if you are a mature business right that's exactly the question that you need to ask yourself right so this is one of the things next uh lots of people actually abuse communities so they think okay there is community all I need to do is come and post the links to my blog posts blog articles newsletter podcast webinar and everybody should join uh, should should basically click the link and read or listen to but it doesn't work that way <laughs> so you need to really engage right become an active member of that community build relationship with people and that's another thing that lots of uh lots of companies don't don't realize um just wanted to drop my five cents and we still have 40 people with us online which is really cool after one hour so again let's do a double check how was this episode for you guys share with us in the chat i saw some feedback from sanya super useful session 
uh, wish it is longer. <laughs> yeah, I wish as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, Murray, brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot to Sam for joining us and for sharing all of that stuff. Kaylee, this was a gold mine. Kate, this has been amazing. Christina, great session. Elaine, great value. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot for your feedback. And yeah, unfortunately, I mentioned this year, Sam won't join our full final summit as a speaker, but in 2024, we'll have the fifth annual edition. So no chances he will skip it. So yeah, recording, we always record the episodes. Stuff I dropped a link to our Spotify channel and YouTube channel. So iTunes, whatever you prefer, the podcast episode will be available everywhere. And uh, please, Follow Sam on LinkedIn. He shares fantastic content about B2B demand generation. Tons of value. Yes. Sam. Uh, it's been fun. Sam. Appreciate it. Yes. And I will definitely share everything out as, as promised. I'll, I'll get that over to the team. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot for preparing these spreadsheets and sharing your knowledge. Guys, thank you for joining us and for being really engaged community with cool questions. Appreciate it. And see everybody next week. Stay tuned. Cheers. Take care. Bye, everyone.